Dwayne uh, gave me a good introduction. Uh, unlike the other guys, maybe I require a little introduction because I haven't been around as long. Uh, like I said, I grew up on the ranch, went off to get educated in some different places, uh, worked in some different places, and eventually came back. And so, uh, so now I'm living 50 miles from where I grew up, and I'm happy to be back around here. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about integrating livestock and crops, and the first question <laughs> we should probably address is why would you do that? You know, I grew up uh, with our family calving in March, and I know that can be a pain. So, if, you know, with things like that, cattle can be a pain, livestock can be a pain. If you want to get into the livestock business, um, you should have a good reason for doing it. And some people love it, some people not so much, right? Um, so, so what are some of the reasons we would even consider this to begin with? If you're farming, you I split up some uh, different crops here on the left hand side, the, what I call the standard crops that you might grow in a crop rotation. Um, but if you have livestock, and you, then you open up the door to a lot of other possibilities for biological and economic diversity you can add into your rotation. All these forage and perennial crops, right? Now you could plant these without livestock, but if you've got the livestock, you can harvest them and make some money off of it, and you can also keep those nutrients on your fields and improve your soil health. And a couple of these uh, on here are like alfalfa and switchgrass. And those are examples of some perennials we can use too. So you get some diversity that you can add to rotations, and you also get uh, the opportunity to take advantage of some perennial species. One of the reasons we like to use perennial species is illustrated here. This is a, I believe it's a big blue stem. And you look at, you know, it's like six inches tall or so, and you look at the root system it's got under it. Um, and this is, you know, early in the year that the above ground it's going to grow taller, but you know, this is a perennial plant, so those roots are down there all the time compared to your annual plants which are starting from a seed and even if they do eventually develop uh, deep roots, they don't look like this at the beginning of the season, right? And uh, on the other side we've got, for, this is again is a big blue stem and there's a lead plant next to it. Uh, on a poster, and I, I put that one in there to provide a little bit of scale um, in terms of depth. But you know, these, these native perennial tall grass species like uh, big blue stem, switchgrass, uh, even you know, little blue stem, which is a little shorter, you know, they can put their roots down six feet and more in the ground. And so when they get those roots down that deep, they're accessing moisture and they're accessing nutrients. Of course, that your annual crops are probably not going to be able to access or only for a very short period of time during the growing season. And they're taking those nutrients, they're bringing them back up to the surface and cycling them and making them available again for other crops in the future. And in, for, in full disclosure, I also have to tell you that these, these were grown in pots and so because they wanted to get the roots out and really nicely and look at. So, uh, you know, actual results may vary in your field, you know, and from soil type to soil type. So this is kind of a ideal situation for those root systems. Uh, here's another example. This is lead plant again, which you may find in some of your pastures. It's a legume. It's a short shrub. It's, it's pretty short, but you can see, you know, the example of what that root system uh, can really look like. And this lead plant is a legume, so it's going to be fixing nitrogen, you know, in association with the bacteria in the soil. I felt like I had to throw a Wendell Berry quote in here. He's one of my favorite authors and he's a farmer and I thought it fit this presentation pretty well. He says, like a thrifty housewife, Mother Nature wastes nothing, not a bite of food or a drop of water. She keeps serving a menu of delectable and nourishing leftovers. So Duane mentioned uh, my wife being a doctor and, and me taking care of the kids and so a lot of the cooking falls on me. So I love having leftovers around <laughs> because it's a night off from cooking, right? And this is the, the way Mother Nature sees things is there isn't waste in nature, right? W Mother Nature is always taking the, the leftovers and cycling them back through, cycling them back through. And that's how we should be thinking about our farms. We should be thinking about our farms as uh, biological systems or ecosystems uh, where we have uh, a variety of plants, animals, soil, microbes, these are all working together. We've got flows of energy, water, and minerals on the farm or in, and in this ecosystem. So what, you know, in this area, what did, 
the ecosystem look like before? That's a good question to ask if you want to learn about how, how Mother Nature did things. How Mother Nature did things here, it, it was working for her, and it, as much as we can mimic that, we'll probably be uh, getting, taking strides ahead in our farming systems, okay? So Mother Nature's ecosystem here looks something like this with a, a large variety of plant species growing all mixed together. She had herbivores like the bison, the elk, uh, rabbits, whatnot, all other uh, species of animals and kingdoms, of, or like, uh, I shouldn't say kingdoms, <laughs> but uh, say like birds, for instance. Um, and, and so many different kinds of animals, and this is just above ground. Above, below ground, of course, we've got a lot going on there as well. And uh, previously, Doug mentioned the carbon cycle. And I actually wanted to talk about the carbon cycle a little bit. Uh, this is kind of a, a simplified version, but you know, we start out with carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Plants are taking that carbon dioxide up. They're incorporating it into their bodies. If you take the grass and you dried it down, took all the water out of it, what you'd have left is about 40% carbon. Okay, so there's a lot of carbon in that plant, both in the, the above ground part and in the roots below ground. Also, their plants are uh, sending out exudates into the soil, so they're sending carbon out into the soil through their roots as well. Uh, when those plants die, of course, their organic matter returns to the soil and they're consumed by herbivores. And so, in the case of the bison or our cattle, sheep, goats, these are all ruminant animals. And so in the rumen, they have uh, a large number of microorganisms, just like in the soil, those microorganisms, microorganisms are breaking down the plant matter. And when they do that, they release gases. Uh, they release carbon back to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide and as methane. Okay, so that's where a lot of that carbon is going. Some of it, though, of course, gets excreted uh, as poop back to the soil, and it's feeding our soils again. <clears throat> now, that, to quantify that simplified cycle, uh, I wanted to put some numbers to it, and so I made the assumption we had 10 acres per cow for six months. So you could imagine your summer grazing, 10 acres per cow, okay? How much carbon is she going to eat over that time? Well, it's up around here, around 270 pounds per acre or so of carbon that she's going to consume. And what's the ultimate destination of that carbon? Uh, some of it goes off as met in methane. As I said before, that's the CH4 from the previous slide. A lot of it goes off as carbon dioxide. About 40% of the carbon ends up in feces. So that's the, the portion that you're getting returned back to your field. And then a little bit's retained, and you can see it's a pretty small number, probably around 10 pounds of carbon or so retained. And what I mean by that, uh, if, you're, if we're talking about a mature cow, her body weight's not really changing very much over the long term, but her calf is growing. And so that calf, some of that carbon that the calf it, is going into the calf, and the calf is using it to, to build up its body. Okay, so now talking about nitrogen, there, here's a simple version of the nitrogen cycle. Uh, it has a lot of similarities to the carbon, but there's also quite a bit of difference. Uh, so a couple of important difference, I should say. Uh, we've got nitrogen in the atmosphere as a gas. Here we've got lead plant again, which I introduced earlier. Uh, lead plant and you know other legumes can can bring nitrogen into the soil. We've got other ways of nitrogen coming into the soil as well, uh, like Doug mentioned, the, the storms and through rainfall. And, but when this plant is eaten by the, the herbivore, in this case, they're not releasing uh, very much gas, in the, for, nitrogen gas, back into the atmosphere. Instead, that nitrogen is just about all coming back into the soil, and this time we've got urine included in the cycle too, because that's where a lot of the nitrogen goes. So just about all the nitrogen they consume is going to go back into the soil. <clears throat> so back to this, the same example of uh, one cow on 10 acres for six months. How much nitrogen does she actually eat? About 10 pounds per acre. And where does it end up? 
Well, like I said, most of it is, is urine and feces is going back to the soil. Now, once it does go back to the soil, uh, some, some of that is going to be released back to the atmosphere as a gas, but it's not directly going from the animal to the air as a gas. It's, it's going to get into the soil first, or at least on the soil surface. And then finally at the bottom I've got retained. So once again, that's nitrogen is a component of muscle. And so if we're talking about a cow, the nitrogen that's retained really is in that calf, the calf's body as it grows. So when you take the calf off pasture, you are removing some nitrogen from your pasture, but it's a relatively small amount. Um, you know, you look over here and it's only about maybe two pounds per acre of nitrogen that would be coming off in that calf. Okay, so that's a, that's a pasture situation. Now, suppose you take that calf, and when you wean him, you take that calf, 500 pound calf, you put him in a feedlot. What happens? How do, how do things change? I put some numbers to that, and anytime you put numbers to a situation like that, you have to make a bunch of assumptions, right? So some of the assumptions I made were 500 pound calf, put him in the feed, feedlot for six months, and say he was gaining 2.1 pound, pounds a day over that time period, okay? How much do you have to take off your field? So you've got your field over here, you've got your feedlot over here. You're taking a lot of crop off of that field, bringing it over to the calf to feed him, right? How much nutrients, how much organic matter are you taking off your field and bringing to the calf and putting in the feedlot? Well, it's going to be about 56 pounds of nitrogen for six months of feeding, six pounds of phosphorus, and 3,200 pounds of organic matter. Uh, now, if you own the feedlot, maybe you take some of that back and apply it to the land. If you don't either own the feedlot, that's gone, right? You lost all of these nutrients, all this organic matter. And uh, 3,200 pounds of organic matter, that would be if you calculate it out roughly, probably a little less than 30 bushels per acre of wheat crop. So, um, so if, if you thought about your yield being about 3,200 pounds per acre, then you can look at these numbers I've got here and think of them as per acre numbers. Uh, so 56 pounds per acre of nitrogen, 6 pounds per acre of phosphorus that you're taking off your land. Now if your yields are higher than that, then you're, you know, you're taking off more nitrogen and phosphorus. Your yields are lower, you're going to be taking off less. In contrast, this other column here with the grazing, in contrast, say we had that calf, we didn't put him in the feedlot, we put him on the field. And now we're grazing a cover crop or corn residue or something. But in, however we managed to do it, we kept that calf on the field and he grazed the same diet, exact same diet. What do you lose? Well, you're still going to lose nine pounds of nitrogen because that calf's growing, building up his body, and you're gonna lose two pounds of phosphorus, and you're gonna lose some of the organic matter because, of course, he's eating it, and I, was tell I told you that a lot of that carbon is being, you know, that's broken down in the room and goes back into the atmosphere as gas, right? So you're not saving everything, but, but you are retaining a lot more on your pasture or on your cropland. And I also should mention that I, when I calculated these numbers here, I assumed that there was no waste. So you had that cast diet balanced perfectly to gain 2.1 pounds per day. Your, your hay, you didn't have any rotting hay, you know, or you didn't, you didn't lose anything along the way. So essentially what I'm saying is these are kind of, cons these are conservative estimates. Okay, these are conservative estimates. <clears throat> so what's the value of those? I just took the numbers from the last slide and I just subtracted. 56 pounds of nitrogen from the feedlot, 9 pounds when you're grazing. Uh, what's the difference? 47 pounds per acre difference of nitrogen. What's the value of that? And, you know, I picked up some prices for the nitrogen and the phosphorus. And between the two of them here, then the value per acre, just of nitrogen to phosphorus, you take off $17.50. I put question marks at the bottom for the organic matter because uh, I... I'm not sure what price to put in there. Maybe it's worth a lot more than the nitrogen and phosphorus. We know, you know, adding that organic matter to your soil is extremely valuable. Uh, I wasn't going to go out on a limb here and tell you how much it was worth, but I didn't want to leave it off the slide because I didn't want anyone to forget about it, myself included. <laughs> 
So <clears throat> I'm making my case here for keeping them on the soil. The question now is how do we do it? Uh, one of the ways we're looking at doing it is putting a perennial in the rotation. And uh, Duane's always telling me about this traditional system that they have in Argentina where they, they used to do seven years of cropping in, in rotation and they would rotate that with seven years of a perennial crop. And in that, in that perennial pasture they'd have a mix of a grass and legume mixture and so with that legume in there of course they're feeding nitrogen back into the soil during the pasture phase and they're grazing it they're not haying it so they're returning all of those nutrients. So they've got 50% of the time their crop plant is actually in pasture, 50% of the time. At Dakota Lakes, we've started uh, a new rotation where we've got uh, 15 years of, in the cropland, rotating with five years in perennial pasture. Okay, this is, this is new and we're, we're into our uh, third year now of the perennial sequence. So 17 years from now, <laughs> we'll, we'll have reached the end of one of these rotations. So I don't have data from this yet to share with you. And I can't tell you that, you know, what we're doing here is 25% is of our time we're in perennial pasture. Whereas in that Argentina system, it was 50% time. Is 25% enough? I don't know. We don't know that yet. Uh, it's an experiment. And, but this is what we're trying. and so. We, and uh, in, in the crop part of it, we've got winter wheat, a corn or sorghum, and a cool season broadleaf. So during the 15 years when it's in cropping, this is what that rotation is. So two out of these three are high, uh, high residue crops that we're putting in the soil. And then we add on, you know, the extra years of perennial. So we're hoping that with all of that, with the perennial plus, two-thirds high residue crop that we'll see improvements in the soil quality there. <clears throat> okay, so the perennial in the rotation, that's one thing that we're doing at Dakota Lakes. Another thing we're doing is winter grazing. <clears throat> this is a, a little bit of uh, our cow winter grazing facts here to start off with. We've got, uh, this is from last year. We did, uh, we started grazing October 31st. We went to April 30th. And during that time, we used 0.7 acres of corn residue per cow per month and 0.29 acres of swaths per cow per month. The swaths are cover crop swaths, so uh, a lot of, we had a lot of oats and barley in there, but some other species as well, like peas and flax and, and some brassicas, um, like uh, canola or rape or something like that. And then in addition, we fed them some concentrate. And so mostly, most of that was peas, flax meal, and soy meal. And that's, uh, we're, we're fall calving. And so, our, so during the winter, our cows are, are lactating. So we've got higher nutritional needs than say a spring calving person would have. And so we did have these, these supplements that we gave them and they're high in both energy and protein. Uh, another thing to mention is that you know, we, they had the corn and the swaths, and at the research farm, we've got fields of, of corn and swaths that are close enough together that we can give the cows access to both of them at the same time, and so they can kind of balance their diet between the two. Uh, we also fed a little bit of concentrate to the calves as a, in a creep system, and we used a little bit of hay, and I put it down here as 100 pounds of hay per cow per month, uh, that's, a, that's an average, right? They, they, we, weren't, we weren't giving the cows a little bit of hay every day. What we did is we had some bales that we could use for emergency situations or for instance in the spring uh, when the soil began to, the, the, the snow was beginning to melt, the surface of the soil was beginning to melt, but it was still uh, frozen below deeper there was nowhere for that, that uh, snow melt to go, and so the su surface soil stayed very wet. We pulled the cows off at that time and put them on some uh, perennial grass and we fed some bales over there for a little while until that, uh, we had enough of a thaw that the, the moisture in the field could, could drain down, and then we brought the cows back on to the field at that time. 
and continue to graze until we had finished up our swaths. <clears throat> this is a picture of this year's swaths. And this is, uh, like I mentioned before, it's primarily uh, oats, barley, and then with uh, peas. Those would be the three primary species that we had out there. There's some other stuff, but those are the three primary ones. And you can notice some stripes, like there's kind of a darker green stripe and a lighter green stripe and a darker green stripe. We did a little experiment with uh, applying fertilizer or not applying fertilizer to these swaths. And what we observed just looking at it is that uh, in the, the area where we applied the nitrogen, we had more, it, it appeared that there's more grass. I mean, it appears darker green, it looks a little taller, and, and more grass versus where we didn't apply the nitrogen, a little bit more of the pea was in there, which makes sense, of course, because pea is going to be able to get some of its own nitrogen, and so it did a little better where there wasn't the nitrogen. Uh, but we didn't see much of a difference in yield. We did this on a couple different fields. On um, One of them, it looked like the yield on the nitrogen fertilized was a little higher. The other one, it looked like the nitrogen uh, fertilized yield was a little bit lower. Uh, one thing, though, that did come out of it also was that the grasses, the oats and the, and the barley were a little bit higher in nitrogen content or, or pr crude protein content. So a little bit better feed quality where we had applied the nitrogen. This was planted, uh, one of the fields was planted July 17th, another one July 30th. Under irrigation? These are, yes, these are, these are under irrigation. So here's what their swaths look like after being cut. And again, you see those stripes. And so you can see where we fertilized, we had uh, more regrowth too. <clears throat> Another thing to note here, uh, you can see the electric fence running across here. It's maybe a little faint. There's one of our posts right there. And so you can see that what we're doing is running the, the fence perpendicular to the swaths. And, and what we would do is every day we move that fence a little bit further ahead. And so what we think that does for us, uh, cuts down, you know, the cattle can't, because they don't have access to the whole field at once, they're not walking all over the swaths, not laying down and bedding in them, they're not pooping and peeing on them. We're keeping, you know, we have a lot less wastage this way. We get a lot more of that swath going into the cow's mouth. And, uh, you know, it's not wastage from the soil's perspective, I guess, if she lays down on it, but we'd rather have them eat as much of it as we could before we put it back on the soil. This is just a bit more of a close-up of that. What was the cutting date of your swaths? <sighs> cutting date. I, Dwayne, do you know what our cutting date was? Uh, it was uh, very early October on most of it. Very early October on most of it. And how long did you leave it before it was grazing? What we... Those grazing? Were grazing. I know last year it was October 31st. I guess I'm not certain what date exactly this year. But it, so, no, so you said early, it was in November, you early said, Dwayne? Yeah. Early November this year, October 31st last year. We, we, the, stayed, we stayed to swapping for the quality of the, of the grain, of the, of the oats and the barley. If you leave it standing there too long, it gets too mature. We had that issue last year on, on part of the field where it got too mature and the quality went down. They really, they ate it, but they didn't like it as much. And they, they left it to last and whatever, that part of the field. And, and so we tried to stage it this year. We probably got a bit late because we had all that wet weather there that happened in October. And so we were waiting for that to kind of go away before we swapped. No, it was before the frost. Oh, the question was, was they hadn't had a frost. No, we want to take it before the frost. And the oats and barley and stuff were pretty resilient to frost. The corn shortage and stuff would get whacked earlier, so you have to you have to watch the weather forecast too. It's more of an art than science. 
<laughs> That's all right. <clears throat> so with, uh, I mentioned that we're fall calving. And so with that, of course, comes the, the need for some shelter. If you've been to Dakota Lakes for a tour before, you may have ridden up here on the bleachers. But if you look back here, we now have this uh, little wing thing that we can fold down and we've got a portable calf shelter that we can drive around and the calves can just come under here. <clears throat> this is a picture of one of those fields uh, after we've swath grazed it. And uh, what I wanted to draw attention to was, for the most part, the amount of residue that we've got there. I've got several pictures coming in a little closer here. You practically can't see any soil. If you look closely right here, there's a little bit of soil and a little bit of a hoof print in it. But you look around here and uh, the, the surface is covered with plant litter. Uh, you take a closer look. And so, you know, where we're doing this cover crop grazing, these are, these are fields that have been in no-till for decades and we've got a lot of residue on the surface. So we've got, the, we've got good soil structure to begin with. We've got the armor on top of that. And as I mentioned, you know, when we get into, got in into an iffy situation last spring where we kind of had those wet soils, we pulled the cows off. So we're starting with resilient soils to begin with and then we're being kind of careful about when we have them on there, right? To, to avoid doing damage to the soils. <clears throat> Here's uh, some of the cows on the corn stalks and in this picture we've got our uh, irrigator here and in some of the fields where, where we it's essentially where it's convenient to use these irrigators we actually hang the fence the electric fence off of the irrigator which with some ropes down here and then we put a, a fence post and then you can run an electric wire along the irrigator and then that makes it real easy to ration that out day by day. Every day you can go out there and just move your fence ahead a little bit and give them a little bit more of the corn swath or corn <laughs> corn residue or cover crop swath, either one. Um, in some of the fields we don't have that and so we're out there doing it manually, you know, putting posts in the ground. <clears throat> um, how do they handle snow? I know this isn't a real big pile of snow here, but uh, this is a, I took this picture uh, in the morning before they'd gotten their new allocation of swath, so they had cleaned it up really well at that point. You can tell there used to be a swath right here. You know, they just got through the snow and they, they ate it up. Now, we, we, you know, if the snow crusts over, you may have a little bit of trouble. You know, we, the cows may have trouble getting down to it, but you, know, you can drive across it with a side-by-side, a, -side, a four-wheeler or something to kind of break through that. And once you break through it, then they have an easier time getting their nose in there and getting under the snow. And they'll just follow, once they know where that swath is, then they can just kind of follow it along. You know, they don't have to hunt all over the place to try to find them. Uh, here's a, a picture from last year. You can tell, you know, where the fence is running right here. And they, the cows have been in here already. They haven't cleaned it up yet. But they obviously, you know, expose where that swath is. <clears throat> so a concern... Uh, a concern might be what's this going to do to your soil, All right? And so we've had we've had cows over winter on the Dakota Lakes Research Farm four years now, or this is our fourth winter with cows there. Uh, this is just we just have one year that we've collected data on the soils to see whether or not there was any impact. Okay, and I I have a couple slides here of the bulk density of the soil that we that uh, we collected. It was uh, Dr. Jose Guzman, who's a soil scientist based at Dakota Lakes, he and his team collected this data. He shared this with me. And what we found, well, and, and I guess, uh, so I've got grazed and ungrazed treatments here. What we did in the fields where we grazed, we went out and we built some cages or we put some electric wire up a little part of the field that we didn't let the cows in. So we could come in there and take samples, you know, right in the same field side by side, an area that got grazed and an area that didn't get grazed. And what, what they found was in, in one of the fields, they, they, even in the spring, right after the cattle came out, they couldn't find any difference in bulk density in grazed versus ungrazed. In another one of the fields where they sampled, and that's the one I'm showing you here, they did find a difference. Uh, they measured at a bunch of different depths. You know, this is going down to 36 inches or 3 feet. The only spot they found any difference was right at the surface in that first 3 inches of soil. Uh, and, so in the spring, 
They did find an increase in bulk density there, but by the fall, same field, uh, it was completely gone. So we had a, a small impact early in the year. By the fall, it had disappeared. <clears throat> Another thing we did with these grazed and non-grazed areas is we did stand counts on corn, and two fields of corn, two fields of soybean that had been grazed the pre previous year, uh, and on none of them could we find any difference in stand counts. Uh, we also went in and took yield samples in both of them and, you know, by hand, and this two soybean fields, two in corn fields, and these next four slides all say the same thing. Uh, I guess I put four in <laughs> to drive the point home maybe, or because, or because each field was a little bit different situation. But, the, but all four of them say the same thing, which is we could not find any difference in yield uh, after grazing or, or not having grazed. Uh, the, the, dip, the particulars about this one is it's continuous corn, so we had, grazed, uh, we had grazed corn residue and put corn back on it. There was no difference in yield. This one was corn that had followed wheat, and so we had wheat in 2017 and then a cover crop. So the cattle were grazing that cover crop there was no impact on the following corn crop. This one was soybeans following corn, so the cattle had grazed the corn residue. There was no impact on the subsequent soybean yield. And the last one, uh, soybean following wheat and a cover crop. So the cattle were grazing that cover crop. There was no impact on the soybean yield. <clears throat> All right, so, Shifting gears now a little bit from the winter to spring, summer, fall. Uh, this is an area, I'm, I'm more of a range scientist than an agronomist, and, and so this is a little bit more my, my area. Uh, going back to a few more cattle facts again, we, our 205 day weaning weights was 525 pounds last year. Uh, these were first calf heifers. Our weaned calves gained almost one and a half pounds a day from April through July. So we kept them on the farm after weaning and had them grazing and we gave them uh, some supplements if we thought the forage quality wasn't good enough uh, from what they could get from the pastures. And then after we weaned, we kept our 10 of our heifers and they gained 1.6 pounds a day from July to October. So that's bringing them around to, to being yearlings again. <coughs> and uh, we haven't done it yet. One of the, I mean, an idea that we have, we, you know, we want to keep the cattle on the land as long as possible. Keep them on, on the pastures, keep them on the fields and out of the feedlots as long as we possibly can. Uh, similar, I think, to what Doug was saying earlier. Uh, we haven't finished any out there yet, but I would like to see us go that direction to try to see if we can finish cattle on, we, uh, we might call it field finishing or something like that. It may be different from grass finishing because you know, in our operation, we are feeding them some supplements, some of those like the flax meal cake and the, the soybean cake and, the, uh, and we fed them some whole peas as well. So it wouldn't be a, a pure grass fed thing, but we would be keeping them on the land. We'd be keeping those nutrients on the land. <clears throat> so as we go into some pictures now of the grass, I want you to keep this in mind. Uh, t first of all, 2017, of course, was very dry. 2018 was wet in a lot of South Dakota. It was not wet <laughs> at Dakota Lakes. We, uh, <clears throat> on August 1st, we were 4.8 inches short of our normal rainfall. You know, and this is after a dry year. And by the end of October, we had received 9.6 inches, and when our normal was 16 and a half. Now that's, so that's starting counting in April there. So we were very dry. <clears throat> so after we came off of the, the swaths and the corn residue, uh, so this would be, this picture was taken in early May. We had, you can see there's a little bit of green in the pasture, not a whole lot. We put a bale on the top of the hill and rolled it down here. So we still had some bales left over. So we started feeding out onto the pasture a little bit and we put the bale, you know, in an area where we could use a little more organic matter on the soil, right? <clears throat> now, this is early June. So we have rented a, a pasture, a perennial pasture, that's right adjacent to the, the crop farm. 
and this pasture has probably been overgrazed for a long time. It's mostly exotic cool season grasses uh, like smooth brome, crested wheatgrass, uh, cheatgrass, Kentucky bluegrass. You'll find a lot of that in there, okay? And so what we're doing with our cows there is that we're, we're trying to do a fairly high stock density and fairly quick rotations. So we have small paddocks and we move every couple days. So this is early June. <clears throat> and then uh, this is later in June, or excuse me, this was, this was April, well, end of April, beginning of June, and then later in June, we have a lot of tall grass planted on the farm too. Tall grasses like switchgrass and big blue stem. Uh, this pasture they're in right here is mostly switchgrass. And so at the end of June, like when this is taken, you can see that it's, it looks nice and lush and green and the, the quality is actually very high. Cattle did uh, seem to enjoy grazing it as much as we can guess as to what they're enjoying and not enjoying. Uh, so those, that grass, maybe I'll take a step back again. Uh, switchgrass and big blue stem, they're both uh, tall grass prairie species. We would have found a lot of them in the Dakota Lakes area and central South Dakota area. Uh, they, they tend to like the wetter spots, but uh, we have found that we've uh, that they, the switchgrass, we have a, a lot of switchgrass around the farm, uh, not as much big blue stem, but we've been planting more of it and interseeding it with, with the switchgrass and increasing the diversity a little bit. And we see that it, it's very high yielding and the timing of, of when it grows is a little bit different too. You know, it's a warm season grass, so we see it coming on in June and July rather than early in the year like the, the exotic grasses like uh, crested wheatgrass and smooth brome, right? So we've been uh, planting this into areas to try to build soil health in those areas, some marginal areas, and we're, we're utilizing it with the cattle. And, but but it, the quality is not as good as those cool season grasses. And so what this slide shows is crude protein content throughout the year, from May, uh, well, until August. And in different parts of the farm, I went around and I sampled some more smooth brome, I sampled some switchgrass because I wanted to make comparisons and see just how much of a difference there was. And we look at early in the year, both of them are above 15% crude protein. So that's, that's more crude protein than those animals need anyway. So both of them are, are doing great then. And then about the time that picture was taken that I just showed you, in late June, that's the switchgrass and that's the smooth brome. The switchgrass actually had a higher crude protein content at that time. And so, and it's, and it's still pretty high, it's uh, up around 13%. So that's very good quality in June. But then after that, after that, in this time of year, you look at the switchgrass and it's still nice and green, <laughs> but the quality's gone down quite a bit. The smooth brome doesn't look that good, but the crude protein was just as good on the smooth brome as the switchgrass. So, so the, the best time for using that switchgrass was probably about this time of year. And with all of these samples, I went to areas and I sampled areas that hadn't been hayed or grazed or anything. So what you see when you look at these numbers late in the year, I mean, that's been growing and standing there all year long. That's getting fairly old. Had we grazed it early in the year and let it regrow, I'm sure this, the quality numbers would look better. And I'm thinking that, that that'd be one strategy we, that we could use with uh, the switchgrass and the big blue stem is to try to graze it earlier and then let it regrow and then we could make the decision if we needed the forage or not. You know, if we need the forage, maybe they graze it again and it's higher quality. If we don't need it, let it feed the soil and just let it stay there. Uh, this is the TDN or the energy content of the forage. So same. Same sample, same comparison, but now instead of protein, looking at the energy, you can think of this, it's like if you read the calories on the back of your Cheerios box. That's essentially what it's telling you here. And they're both very good early in the year, but as we get into midsummer and even late summer, the smooth brome is actually higher quality in terms of energy. But, okay, now going back to how much rainfall we had this year, and look at what the productivity of this big blue stem and switchgrass was. I mean, you can barely see the cattle 
you know, it's coming up just about to the top of the, the pickup here. And this is on a opal clay soil, so it's not a good soil. And that's the kind of productivity we had. So I think if you get the, so, and well, and here I did some measuring too in that, in that field where, that I just showed you the picture of, we've got some degraded range, and then right beside it we've got what I showed you in the picture, the switchgrass and the big blue stem. And so I, I went and I sampled right, you know, side by side. I went this direction into the, the old rangeland and I went this way into the, the switchgrass and big blue stem and I took samples and I did that at several points down the slope. And, and what I found was that in terms of tonnage, we had twice as the tonnage of the tall grasses as we did of the degraded range. And that degraded range, it, it did have some native species in it, some western wheatgrass and some needlegrass, but also had some uh, smooth brome and crested wheatgrass in it. Uh, the, the crude protein content was pretty low for both of them. The, the energy was particularly low in the switchgrass and the big blue stem. So, so for soil health, you know, the tonnage is great. And, and like I said, I think if we utilize it properly at the right times of year, we can get the good quality out of it as well. So in that pasture, <coughs> uh, we actually had a few cows wearing GPS collars. And every 10 minutes, it would mark where that cow was. And so what you see here, the green dots are showing you where, a cow, where the cow was. So all these points are from one cow. Uh, our, the water tank was right there, so there's a lot of points clustered around there in the corners, you know. They like to hang out in corners, so you find a lot of points there. But uh, I was interested in if we could see anything about the cow's preference of where they like to graze. And the, so the green part here is the degraded range part, and then here's our tall grasses here. And we didn't let them have this whole pasture all at once. We put some electric fence up, so we put an electric fence across there. So they started out just with degraded range, and then we gave them a paddock where they could have a choice of one or the other. So now they could, they could eat all of this coming down to here. And then later, and we, later on we had another fence here, so we let them go a little further south. And then finally they got to go all the way to the southern border. And what the results look like are here. Uh, the darker red color means there were more, the cow spent more time there. So if you look at, at first, when they first got here, they had basically an equal preference between the two. Next, this cow actually looks like she slightly preferred the, the tall grass to that degraded range. But by the time we got to the bottom, <laughs> they, they were really avoiding those tall grasses. And it, I was really surprised. I mean, I kept going out there myself and walking through and thinking, it doesn't look like they're, they're using this very much, but it looks so nice and green. And <laughs> why aren't they, you know? And, and I didn't have my, the data back that I showed you uh, just now in terms of the quality measurements. But I think what happened is just as time went on, uh, this got more and more mature and they just didn't like it. And they'd rather be over here grazing what was uh, mostly brown and, and kind of dried up at that point. So that's where we, we kind of were coming in toward the end of the summer. And so we moved off of those pastures. And because we're, we're fall calving and it's been dry, our pastures aren't great, we came back onto cropland at this point. And so uh, the, the plan here was we had a, a cover crop, uh, oats, barley, pea, cover crop, that we planted into this field and baled up. And we were going to bale graze here and then came back and planted some warm season annuals like a, a pearl millet, brown midrib sorghum, that sort of thing. And so the cows were going to be able to bale graze and have the, the pearl millet and sorghum that just, just, they were just going to graze it themselves. We weren't going to swath that. Well, we didn't get any rain. <laughs> so we, we got the bales, but we didn't get the regrowth or we didn't get the second crop. And so we're feeding bales back out onto the field here. <clears throat> and I have several slides of that. So this is a, you know, a field that has a bit of a slope here. Most of the bales have tried to put up on top of the hills. So we're you know, keeping that organic matter uh, back on the field and, and moving it to the top of the hills where we would have seen more erosion and on the slopes. 
You see the calves have come along now. That's where we're calving. Yeah, so that's where we're calving. Is here, here, and at the same time, we gave them access to some corn that had not been harvested. And so they had the bales to eat, they had some corn to eat, and we gave them a little bit of uh, concentrate supplement too. That's all dry land stuff that, that they'll graze with everything and then the corn will all dry. Yeah, so it all, as Wayne said, it's all dry land. Uh, both the, the bale grazed area and this corn area and uh, we, you know, it didn't, it didn't work out the way we planned this year. Uh, I think it, it's still probably, I don't think it's a bad idea, but sometimes even good ideas don't work out because of the conditions you get, right? Uh, but if you have, we, you know, we did get, here with the bale grazed area, we did get one crop off of it. And in a lower rainfall area and without irrigation, you know, maybe that's all you can expect. You could hope for more and maybe, you know, we were ready to take advantage of more rainfall by planting that second crop. But if you don't expect that you're going to have the moisture for it, it may not work out and maybe, maybe a, a better plan would be to go with a full season crop, you know, or just plant a forage crop that you're intending to, to use for forage. And finally, I'm, I'm probably uh, about out of time, but I wanted to at least mention some of the work we're doing out in the pasture. Uh, I did mention that it's a, a degraded pasture. I mean, it's mostly the crested wheatgrass, smooth brome, etc. Uh, there are some natives still in there, uh, especially the, the short grasses, the buffalo grass, the, and uh, blue grama, which are good quality, but they're just not very productive. And so, with that land, what we're trying to do is, is return it to some more productivity, get more of the productive native species back into this pasture that would have been here uh, long ago. And you can see here a, a green stripe and a brown stripe and a green stripe. So what's going on here is that we are trying some herbicide treatments to, to kill what's there. And so we ran those herbicide treatments north-south and then we came in and went east-west with some seeding treatments. And this is the pasture that where we're doing the rotational grazing, you know, moving the cows every couple days. <clears throat> so the, the intention is to find out what does it take to transition this pasture from where it is to something more productive. You know, do we have to have herbicide? Do we have to seed it? You know, what combination of treatments works? You know, can, can just putting the cattle in there on their own and doing this rapid rotational grazing, is that enough to build the productivity back here? Now, unfortunately for us, we started this, you know, we planted it in 2017. <laughs> and then we, so we had a really dry 2017 and a really dry 2018, bad years for trying to get stuff established. You know, we've seen some of these species that we planted show up, but not a whole lot of them yet. I think they've gotten maybe one more year We'll see, see if they appear this year. If not, we may have to reseed. <clears throat> so to, just to wrap things up, uh, the main takeaway points from here, what we're doing at Dakota Lakes and why we're trying to do it, we're trying to keep the cattle and the nutrients on the land, keeping the cattle on the land as long as possible. We're using, uh, I just wrote rotate here, and I guess in this context we could be talking about crops, but I'm actually meaning rotating the cattle. You know, I showed you different, you know, they're, they're moving from field to field to pasture and back and forth between field and pasture. They're not staying in one place for all that long. Uh, we're going to, we're using, taking advantage of full season forage crops and cover crops both. You know, with the irrigation, it gives us a chance to have a, a grain crop and a cover crop afterwards, but in a drier area and without irrigation, uh, that's when you know perhaps a full season forage crop makes more sense if you don't have the moisture for two. And then finally, we're in, uh, we have perennials in our pastures and in rotations, and those are certainly some uh, areas where we're still experimenting, and and uh, the jury's out on on how some of those experiments will come out. All right, well, thank you very much. <clears throat>